What led me to this field to begin with was that I'm a recreational cyclist. I like riding a bicycle long distances. I've been doing it for over 50 years. And very early on, I discovered that if when riding a bike for more than an hour or two, if I didn't eat when riding, I would hit the wall, which is what happens when the body runs out of carbohydrate, when it's carbohydrate dependent, and you feel really lousy and your performance drops. And so I very quickly became a carbohydrate advocate. Interestingly, at this time, uh, 40 or so years ago, was when the Atkins diet first became popular. And Atkins said, you know, you don't need carbs to feel well and function well. Well, I was a newly minted young doctor, and I was feeling my oats, and I was set out to prove Bob Atkins wrong. And guess what? Prove myself wrong. Now actually, it wasn't quite that simple because if you go on a ketogenic diet for a week or two weeks, your performance does drop. And so my experience had been only in short-term restrictions in carbs. So we did a study that lasted six weeks, and by the third week of the six-week study, people's performance was coming back up. And by six to 12 weeks, their performance was back to or above where they'd started the body becomes capable of burning almost all of its energy from fat. In this process, back in 1980, I coined a term nutritional ketosis and another term keto adaptation. So the first thing you have to consider when listening to someone talk about nutritional ketosis or ketogenic diets is how can you trust what they are saying? The reason is that there are a lot of self-appointed experts out there, but very few people in the medical arena uh, have much training in nutrition, and most of them have absolutely no training or research experience in nutritional ketosis. That is, most people get their expertise by um, reading what other people have done. Now, why should you trust me? I mean, I'm an MD, and I can tell you I had no training in nutrition in medical school back when I uh, went through that process. Uh, but after I completed my medical education, curiosity drove me back to school, and I spent four years doing a, a PhD in nutritional biochemistry because I realized there were a bunch of paradoxes between what I was taught to believe and what the evidence seemed to present. Um, so after completing that, my PhD, I went on to do two years of formal training in clinical nutrition. Uh, since then, I've published 80 papers. I've co-authored three books. Uh, I've been studying and prescribing ketogenic diets for 40 years. The first point I want to make is that nutritional ketosis is a very powerful tool when properly done. But it's not simple. It's not just a matter of cutting out carbs. And the other point is that particularly in people who have medical conditions, it's not always safe. So my goal in, in, in presenting this information to you is to share the power of, of nutritional ketosis, share the fact that it can uh, reverse and, and or prevent very significant medical diseases, oftentimes without or taking away the medications that are currently being used for those conditions. With this power comes risk, particularly as it relates to having being on medication, because if you reverse the disease and you don't take away the medication, you can have major side effects. Let's discuss what's a ketone. It turns out that there are two compounds that the body makes from fat, and the body meaning the liver, makes two compounds from fat, which are classified as, and I put this in air quotes, ketones. I won't get into the details of, of the technicalities on that. Now these can either be made from body fat, that is fat we've eaten before and stored, or fat that we eat and, and that circulates through the blood after digestion. Fats that are eaten or stored when they circulate through the blood are difficult to transport. They're in what are called lipoprotein particles. Um, and these are the things that you, you we're measuring when we measure cholesterol and triglycerides and things like that. And because doctors worry about these things, you might ma imagine that having too much of them is a, is a problem. Well, it turns out that ketones, when fats are in the liver are made into ketones, you no longer have to worry about lipoproteins because these are water-soluble particles and they float through the blood, they move into cells easily, uh, and so it's a much more efficient fuel for the body to use. Once it's in the bloodstream in adequate levels, it can feed the brain, it can feed your heart, and it can feed your muscles. Uh, and as we'll mention in a few minutes, it can do other important things as well. Now, how do we know it can feed the brain? Well, there were actually some, let's say, dangerous experiments done back in the 1960s where patients who'd been fasting for weeks, so they had quite high ketone levels, were then infused with insulin, which drove the blood sugar down to an extremely low level to the point where it should cause people to pass out. 
And as long as there are ketones in the blood, the brain function just fine. So we know that ketones are a very efficient and effective brain fuel. We've discovered in the last five years that ketones are a very potent signal that talks to our genes. And some of the genes it's talked to are the genes that protect us from things that we call oxidative stress or free radicals. And this is really important because these are the root causes of a number of diseases, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, inflammatory bowel disease, high blood pressure, and also people with seizures oftentimes have dramatic results when they get on a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And it's not so much about fuel as it is about reducing oxidative stress and inflammation. Where did nutritional ketosis come from? And why did we have to define that as a term? Over a century ago, doctors figured out that when people with what, what's called type 1 diabetes, the diabetes typically of younger folks where the pancreas stops making any insulin at all, they uh, aren't, can't use glucose at all for fuel, and the body overproduces ketones. The ketones build up to very high levels, and that's called ketoacidosis. So when ketones build up to very high levels, you can actually smell them on a person. It's like a smell this, the, these ketones and say, ah, you know, this is a, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. And they realize that that changes the acid levels in the blood, and that's ketoacidosis. But these are vastly elevated levels of ketones. So figure, let's say, a number of 20. Um, would be an extremely high level of ketones. But if you're eating a well-formulated ketogenic diet, your blood levels are not 20. Your blood levels will be in the range of 0.5 to 3. So it's one-tenth that very high level. Um, and yet, if you eat, say, orange juice and bagel for breakfast, uh, after breakfast, your ketone levels will not be 0.5 to 3. They'll be 0.1 or 0.2, so one-tenth 10 times higher is nutritional ketosis, 10 times higher than that is ketoacidosis. Um, and so we define this state of nutritional ketosis as being a safe blood level where ketones function to feed vital organs in the body when you're not eating a whole lot of carbohydrate. You can see in the green zone between 0.5 and 3 or 4, that's what we call the optimum ketone zone. That's where ketones have beneficial effects in terms of feeding the brain and other organs in the body. And as you can see, if you're in total starvation, which we don't recommend uh, because of negative effects on lean tissue and, and organ function, total starvation ketones will go up as high as seven. And you don't get anywhere near the risk of ketoacidosis till the numbers are above 10. These are very distinct states differentiating nutritional ketosis from diabetic ketoacidosis. The reason we know that this is, it's not a rumor or word of mouth, there are some very solid scientific papers in the medical literature now indicating not just that, gee, looks like inflammation goes down. We actually know precisely how the beta-hydroxybutyrate, this primary ketone we have in our blood, makes in inflammation and oxidative stress uh, go down and provides optimized control for some inflammatory diseases. Let's kind of get to a little bit more practical information. How does one get into nutritional ketosis? People who have reason to want to have benefit, if they have type 2 diabetes or they're severely overweight or have hypertension, very often those people have what we call insulin resistance. That is, their body has begun to lose its responsiveness to this hormone insulin, which is the hormone that, that causes blood sugar to go into cells and also manages body fat metabolism. So if you're insulin resistant, you probably have to get your daily total carbohydrate intake down somewhere between 20 and 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. If you want to think about that in terms of macronutrients, that's less than 10% and oftentimes less than 5% of your total daily energy intake comes from carbs. And so that's very carb restricted. And the more insulin resistant the person is, the lower they have to go to initially uh, get into a state of nutritional ketosis. And then the other key point of a well-formulated ketogenic diet is this is not a calorie-restricted stop eating when you eat X number of calories per day. This is a diet, when it's done right, is eaten to satiety. That is, when you finish a meal, you should be satiated and you shouldn't be hungry till it's time for your next meal. And the way you do that, if you're eating very little carbohydrate and moderate protein, is the majority of your dietary calories have to come from fat. And we'll come back to the safety issues around, is it okay to eat that much fat if it's more than half my calories? Uh, and the answer is yes.